there's been a lot of talk about recounts in this election. And all I know is in my family, the way we won elections is we had people like Mayor Daley make sure there were enough votes for us when we got elected. So it's great to be in Chicago. Um, my family has uh, really, this, this city has financed more than its fair share of political campaigns for my family because of the merchandise part. And I can honestly tell you, uh, when I first ran for Congress myself, I had Bill Daley Jr. as the co-chair of my campaign, and I had David Axelrod as my senior political advisor. So I had Chicago in the house. Um, so I, uh, you know, when I first ran for Congress, there were so many members of my family either in office or running for office at the same time. I had my cousin Kathleen, who was lieutenant governor. I had my cousin Mark, who's in the House of Delegates. I had my cousin Joe, who's a member of Congress, and of course my late father, who was in the Senate. And of course, so many of us were running at the same time, we wanted to save the, the money because these campaigns are so expensive. We came up with a, a lawn sign that we could distribute amongst all of us and it basically said, vote for the Kennedy nearest you. <laughs> so I got elected uh, at the age of 21 to the Rhode Island legislature and then as uh, the youngest member of the Rhode Island House, and then at the age of 27, I was elected as the youngest member of Congress, and then at 31, elected by my colleagues to Democratic leadership. But I just want to clear to everyone in this room that none of it had to do with my last name being Kennedy whatsoever. It's all my good looks and personality that got me so far in, in politics. So I have inherited, uh, you know, not only the great fortune of being able to do this advocacy because of the wise investments of my late grandfather. Um, but I've inherited a legacy uh, from my family uh, that is uh, pro pro profound, very profound. You know, you know uh, my Aunt Eunice uh, was here along with many of you in the 60s to start uh, a movement called Special Olympics. And it all started in Soldiers Field here in Chicago. And that movement for Special Olympics has transformed attitudes towards people with intellectual disabilities, not only here in the United States, but in the 187 countries around the world where it's now uh, located. And President Kennedy, aside from saving the world from nuclear annihilation in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, did some other pretty extraordinary things. <laughs> and perhaps the most extraordinary was that he was the first President of the United States to go on national television and talk about civil rights as a moral issue for our country. <laughs> And in his speech, he said, who amongst us would be willing to trade the color of their skin and be content with those who counsel patience and delay? Because you see, at the time, people were saying, okay, we think it might be good to offer the same rights we all enjoy to all of the other Americans who are treated as second-class citizens, but we don't think it should happen right away. That was the attitude of America at the time. And President Kennedy made it very clear that you treat others as you yourself would want to be treated, the golden rule. And when he spoke about that on national television, he was speaking about changing attitudes in this country that we had ingrained in our social conscience towards people simply because of the way they looked. And then he signed the Community Mental Health Act of 1963. And in the signing ceremony, 
He said, those with mental illness need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our communities. And he could not have encapsulated the struggle better for us today. The mentally ill need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our communities. He didn't say beyond the help of our psychiatric hospitals. He didn't say beyond the help of our psychiatrists or psychologists. He didn't say beyond the help of our pharmaceutical companies. He said beyond the help of our communities, meaning we needed everybody to be part of the solution. And unfortunately in our society, when it comes to treating people with mental illness and addiction with dignity, we see it as someone else's job. And part of the change in attitudes that we need as a nation is we need to understand that it's all of us that has to be part of the solution. Because there but for the grace of God goes one of our family members. There but for the grace of God goes one of us. If we are ever confronted in our own lives with a mental illness or addiction. How do we want to be treated in those circumstances? How do we want our children to be treated if they have an intellectual disability, if they have a mental illness or addiction? That is the fundamental cause today. And uh, I am honored to have been the author of the modern day medical civil rights law, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And so, you know, we're about to hear some fantastic business leaders talk about how to employ better mental health practices in the workplace and how revolutionary that's going to be to worker productivity, to avoiding disability, to minimizing liability. And if you start adding up all those costs of paying for the retraining of workers because they fall out because they don't have the adequate support, the cost to business is staggering for not getting it right. We will have less than 4% uptake in employee assistance programs, which absolutely needs to change. We need to have EAPs be ubiquitous in the workplace, actively supporting workers wherever they are in the, in the uh, economy. And we have to have health plans that don't make people wait in order to get their mental illnesses and addictions, which may be early in the cycle from getting treated aggressively and early in the process. And that means you have to have a good benefit package. And of course, if you do that, then you're not going to have the disability costs and the retraining costs that come from losing the valuable productivity of a creative and, and a very ambitious worker who may be limited because of their depression. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the workplace. So I appreciate the, the uh, meeting that we're about to have with all of our business leaders, but let me just say, that this issue can be summed up, first, that it's illogical, illogical that in this day and age we don't treat the brain like we would any other organ of the body. This is the most important organ we have. And our healthcare system ignores it, for the most part. We have to change that. Second, it's illegal now to treat the brain and mental illnesses any differently than any other physical illnesses. Illegal. And finally, it's immoral to treat others in a discriminatory way simply because their illness is a brain illness. Discriminatory. Immoral. Illogical, illegal, immoral. 
What you're going to hear today is all the return on investment of doing mental health in the right way. And I'm happy that we can make the argument that this makes good sense. I mean dollars and cents. But let's not lose sight of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is we must do this. And the law says that whether you're inpatient, in-network, or outpatient, in-network, or inpatient, out-of-network, or outpatient, out-of-network, or need pharmacy or ER benefits, they must be comparable. They must be on par with those that you would receive if you had cancer, cardiovascular disease, or any other physical illness. And the job that we have today is to enforce that law. And so I want to invite those of you who are able to attend to help us kick off Parity Track, which is a 50-state scorecard to measure how each state is doing in helping to enforce a medical civil rights law everywhere in this country. Because I want people to be held accountable in their own states for what they're doing. And two, we've launched Parity Registry, first ever opportunity for consumers who feel that they've been denied wrongfully by their insurer when it comes to getting pre-authorization for your, their mental health or addiction benefits or whether it's fail first models or concurrent reviews. These are all the medical management terms insurance companies use to deny and limit care for those with mental illness and addiction. We want to push back when insurance companies deny these benefits. Because as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without demand. It never has and it never will. And we will not get the benefits we need for our family members, our co-workers, and our friends if we do not enforce this law, which the insurance companies are counting on the fact that there's shame and stigma involved with these illnesses and that's the reason they don't get anybody to push back and really appeal and complain. But I'm happy to say because of the initiative that Peter and Mimi O'Brien took, look amongst you today, we are doing something here in Illinois that is the first in the nation. The first in the nation. First in the nation to organize business leaders, labor leaders, community leaders, educational leaders for a cause. And, and I will never forget the phone call that I got from Peter O'Brien when he lost his son and was heartbroken, and he and Mimi and their family would undoubtedly be. And he could have been just one of these statistics that we read about where there's 42,000 Americans who take their lives every year, or 47,000 who overdose every year, and then fall away in the statistics that are so staggering, but are accompanied by too much silence. But Peter and Mimi O'Brien said, no, we're gonna break the silence. We're going to make sure that we change this atmosphere and change the practice of delivery and mental health here in Illinois so that what happened to us does not have to happen to any other family. And you'll hear from the Surgeon General of the United States if you're able to stay for later uh, reception for the Surgeon General, you'll hear the top doctor in this country talking about compassion. Because at the end of the day, we don't need to intellectualize this. We need to humanize this. And I just love the fact that what is really moving this movement forward is a basic compassion uh, that is embodied by Peter and Amy O'Brien. And I am humbled by it, I'm inspired by it, and this world is going to change because of people like them and because of people like all of you who are in this room. Thank you very much.